Hello and welcome back. Um, this is Bob Boros and this is my Jazz and Tap Dance Life. Uh, we're back again to talk about Bob Fosse and some publicity he's having from the New York Times. Um, two articles that have come out recently that have been a little bit disparaging towards his legacy. Um, I did uh, one video recently about what I call a hit job on Bob Fosse and um, we're going to pick up on the second article and discuss a little bit about that. So this one is actually by dance critic Brian Siebert. Um, writing for the New York Times. Here we are. Okay, because so it's called Hands, Hips, Hats, The Why and How of Fosse Verdon Dance Moves. Um, and it's by Brian Siebert, April 10th, 2019. Um, and the byline here, to get at the Fosse style, a dance critic breaks down who's got the pain, the only film number Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon performed in together, um, which to me is kind of a... A wrong choice of a dance to look at. If you want to quote get at the Fosse style, this is probably a dance that has the least elements of the style that is most notably associated with Bob Fosse. Um, as I did, talked about in my last video, this dance actually has a lot more of Jack Cole in it that came uh, through by way of Gwen Verdon and a lot of the comedic aspects certainly came through I believe from Bob Fosse. So to say that this dance uh, Who's Got the Pain is somehow going to talk about Fosse style um, is something that is just not really a, a smart choice. There'd be definitely be different things um, to uh, look at. So it starts out, Bob Fosse developed a choreographic style so distinctive and influential that it's probably familiar to you even um, if his name isn't. And let's pop that up just a little bit, okay? Um, and it talks about flaring the fingers, the mockingly called jazz hands, sitting into one hip, um, eyes beneath a hat. That is something that you won't see anything at all really in uh, Who's Got the Pain. Yes, there is a hat in there, but certainly not used in the same way that uh, Fosse used in his later style. Um, but really the whole idea of this, if we go all the way to the end and talk about here is um, the last line. Now more than ever to take pleasure in Bob Fosse's dances, you have to reckon with his bad behavior and bad faith. Who's got the pain? We do too. So that's kind of where this whole article is going, is that Bob Fosse basically was an example of bad behavior. Um, he was a bad man. And because knowing that now with our new enlightened uh, viewpoint on the world, this is something that we will live that pain or we will feel that pain um, as we watch these dances, where somehow before we did not watch them. So that's where this article certainly is going to go through. Um, here we talk about Fosse's name is now back in the cultural conversation thanks to the miniseries um, Fosse Verdon which is on FX. So this is what we're talking about in the cultural conversation. So we're really not looking at Bob Fosse the way he has been looked at for the last four decades. Um, not being revered as the way he was in the last four decades. We are now examining him based on current norms or evolving norms of behavior and um, just assessing, you know, blame, assessing shame on someone. And that's what this article is going to be about. So this is where the New York Times is going and Brian Siebert is going with this, um, with this article. And again, as in the last article I talked about, you know, saying that... Um, when Verdon, um, if she's mainly remembered today only by Broadway buffs, that's partly because her film career didn't match her theater success, but in some complicated fashion because of her complicated relationship with Fosse. So again, um, saying that, that Gwen Verdon's reputation and luster somehow um, was diminished because of her relationship with Bob Fosse. And as I talked about in the last article, uh, there were two different type of people two different types of, of creative energy. One was a performer, one was the creator, and they certainly will be known for different reasons. So to blame it on the fact that it's a male-female relationship exclusively is just not getting to where you need to go in terms of talking about who they are. The hats are supposed to be a Cuban. This is supposed to be a mambo, the Cuban dance that was vogue in the 1950s. And he writes, it's characteristic of Fosse to have turned Latin hip into action into something mechanical like a train, typical of him to close off sensuality in cold detachment. So that is what Siebert is seeing from this short clip here. Mechanical like a train, 
typical of Fosse to close off sensuality in cold detachment. Um, that certainly could have been something that you could have said of uh, Sweet Charity, Hey Big Spender, or getting into aspects of Pippin, um, certainly in Chicago. Uh, but this clip here, they are singing. Who's got the pain when they do the mambo? Um, this is something where we are looking at, at a musical theater performance. So they don't dance strongly the entire time. There are times where we focus on what the lyrics are, what they are singing. And in this case, to flip the hat up, that's a comedic point. So to get across those aspects, you don't have big dancing, you don't have these things that he's talking about. So to me, this is more of an example just of how do we make the comedy work in terms of singing this crazy lyric rather than uh, typical of him to close off sensuality in cold detachment. Um, that's a trip. I don't know where he got that, how he saw that in there. Um, quite, quite, a, quite an aspect. Um, so why is he hiding faces? Well, sometimes he blamed his love of hats on his own premature balding. I mean, that's very well known. But the hiding speaks of a deeper insecurity. So this is where we're getting to. So Fosse had problems. He was insecure. This is nothing new. I mean, everybody knows that. He had a, a, a very bad upbringing in terms of what he had to do as a performer, um, dancing in strip clubs at a, at a mid-teenage age at uh, 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, he was also somebody who was the youngest of a big family. You know, he said he had to perform. He had to be out there to get attention. So, yeah, so these are the things that, that he was going through. And these are the things that were going to affect what his, what his dancing style was and what his career was. Um, but these uh, aspects that he, um, Seabird's bringing out, he had bad posture, little turnout, hence the slouching and scrunching and turned in knees. These explanations, though, don't fully square with the early footage of him as a dancer. And see, we see uh, Fosse and Verdon in the big Calypso rums, and underneath the caption, see how big and bold he could be. Well, yes, at this point in his career, if this was about 1958, uh, he was in his very early 30s. Um, he was somebody who was still virile, somebody who was moving in a big fashion. And his early dances were all about physicality and how much energy he put out. If you think of from this moment on with Carol Haney, um, that's where he was. You know, he hadn't developed into other aspects of his career um, in terms of him being a um, director choreographer and putting more different aspects into his dancing. So this is not something that's a major revelation. I think just about anybody, you could say, yes, in their early career, they were a little bit more physical and big. When they're a little bit later, they become a little bit more smaller, detailed, a little bit more refined in what they are doing. Okay. He talks about the backflips. Well, certainly, you know, tricks <laughs> are always big, you know, and in those movie musicals, everybody did a trick like that. Guys did big virile things like this, like a backflip. This is did nothing to, to make a remark about Bob Fosse because he does a backflip. Okay, now this is something that got to me here, but already here in Who's Got the Pain, he, meaning Fosse, was starting to reduce, to do less and focus more on stylization and isolated detail. Look at these eyes, elbows, and thumbs. Um, once again, they are singing Who's Got the Pain when they do the mambo, Who's Got the Pain when they go erp. This is something that's illustrating the lyrics, and it's also something that in any film, at some point, you do have to zoom in and have close-ups of the two performers. This is something Jack Cole dealt with exclusively or, uh, with uh, Betty Grable and Rita Hayworth and, and Marilyn Monroe. You know, you can't show the dance in its entirety. You have to have a close-up of the star. That's what this is about. Um, Fosse was starting to reduce, to do less, and focus more on stylization and isolated detail. I think that's a really, really big stretch. Um, at this point, Fosse was not a, a director, and um, who knows if he even had a say in how this, this piece was filmed. Um, so to, to put all of these choices on him and what was becoming his later style, I, I think you're just looking in the wrong ballpark here, okay? The thumbs probably came from choreographer Jack Cole, Verdon's earlier boss. Uh, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. But Cole took them from Asian dance, okay? Um, like many great artists, Fosse was a smart thief. His borrowing sometimes concealed much of what he took from black dancers. 
Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, everybody borrowed. Everybody saw something from someone else. You could even look at Jack Cole, you know, who took from Dennis Sean, who took from East Indian Dance, and he took from um, Harlem Lindy Swing. He put that all together. Everybody saw what was out there and made their own thing out of it. Nothing new and nothing to make a comment about. Um, over time, the obvious influences of Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly would fade out as Fosse's experiences as a teenager performing in strip clubs surfaced. Um, yes, again, you know, as he became more of a director choreographer looking for projects, looking for things that would speak to him in terms of what his history and what his influences were and that he could translate, those were the things that, that came to him. Sex became what he sold, corrupt transactional sex presented as the dirty truth. Um, dirty, oh, you know, how is that word being meant? Dirty truth. Um, certainly a negative confrontation to that. I would say that Bob Fosse was brutally honest, and if the brutally honest truth was ugly, then it was ugly. But he was somebody who was telling us exactly the way it is. He wasn't coming because he was a, quote, dirty person. Um, what fun to watch these kids enjoy each other. Fosse seems to feed on Verdon's sweetness. Um, I think that Bob Fosse was dancing in a big, open, free, sweet kind of way well before he met Gwen Verdon. If you go back to um, the affairs of Dobie Gillis, um, certainly big, open, free dancing. Um, this is not something that it took Gwen Verdon to bring this out of them. Um, let's see if we go down here. Here's where we start to get into it. Even more than showing you she was a great dancer, Verdon convinced you she was a good person. So now we're coming up again with um, Verdon, female good, male Fosse bad. A counterexample to Fosse's cynicism, which when he was wise, he knew was essential. Um, again, think of his upbringing, think of how he's going to see the world, and those were the type of projects he was drawn to and that he very effectively brought out to the open. Okay. Um, Who's got the pain when they do the mambo? The lyric that Fosse and Verdon sing here is a dumb outsider's joke about the grunting and mambo music, but the question does have answers. He had the pain. You can see it in the work. Um, well, he had a pain that certainly developed in him later on. By You can see it in the work. If by work they mean this dance who's got the pain, this, this dance does not have any pain in it. This dance is nothing but joy and happiness. So I... I don't see how he's saying that you could see the pain within this work. She had the pain, his womanizing for starters, though her performances could convert pain to joy. Uh, well, you know, that certainly is a, another topic for discussion to go into. You know, and at some point they had separated um, and Fosse continued in what his activities were. She did not completely leave him. She did not divorce him. She did not raise anything against him. In fact, she stayed with him and in a way used him because, you know, he did Chicago for her and then she came back and was very instrumental in putting together the Fosse shows, etc. after he died. Um, even um, um, working with um, Debbie Allen, the tour in 1987 of Sweet Charity. So uh, if this was so painful, you know, you would think that she would just completely leave him and she didn't. Now more than ever, to take pleasure in Fosse's dances, you have to reckon with his bad behavior and bad faith. Who's got the pain? We do too. So this is where this whole article is going, coming from. Um, this is why it's here, to get this across, that we as viewers now will feel so much pain knowing how, quote, bad Bob Fosse is, his bad behavior, that we can no longer see his work in the same light. Um, and that's just a, it's a crazy statement, you know, for all of Fosse's career, he was nothing but revered, nothing but revered in every way. And certainly most people think of that. This is only a newer segment of society who's looking for examples to use it, to change it into a certain narrative that they're pushing. So anyway, again, that's where we go with, um, this article by Brian Siebert, um, the why and how a Fosse dance Verdon dance moves. Um, I just don't see it. I don't see where they're coming from. And I think it's using this in a way to get across a certain agenda. Um, if they wanted to do something like this, they certainly should have picked some later examples, 
Um, but of course, Gwen Verdon wouldn't have been dancing in those, and then they couldn't get across that aspect of, of what their discussion was. So anyway, let's go back. Um, and that's kind of what my feelings are on that. So again, I'm Bob Boros. This is my Jazz and Tap Dance Life. Uh, please subscribe to the channel and click the notifications bell. If you have a comment, put it into the comments. Okay, guys. All right. So thanks so much for listening this time. And I um, hope you enjoyed this presentation.